Hello, my dear friends. We have all seen the kitchen sink, and we know that there is an outlet outlet pipe for the kitchen sink. What happens if the outlet pipe blocks? It is not that just the water will get clogged in the sink or the water will get accumulated in the sink. It is much more than that. You cannot properly wash vegetables or you cannot properly wash your dishes. And this may make the food coming to your table late like that. There will be a lot of problems. So, the, to the, the, kitchen, the importance of a simple kitchen sink is like that. Outlet pipe of a kitchen sink is like that. Now, what will be the importance of urethra? That brings us to the topic today. Urethra. When we are going to discuss this topic, we will discuss the urethra as a male urethra and female urethra, urethra as separate. Because you see the male urethra is pretty long. The female urethra is comparatively short. Longer the urethra, more the problems. And we can also see that in both these systems, the genitourinary system is closely associated with the urethra. So we will first see how the male and female urethral system come into being. In brief, we will discuss about the embryology of the urethra. How did the common precursor became separate to urethra and external genitalia, anatomy of the male and female urethra. Then we will discuss regarding the investigations of urethra, pathology of male urethra and pathology of the female urethra separately. Coming to the embryology. Let me take you to the foregut, midgut and hindgut. And this is the hindgut part of it. So, this endodermal tube splits into two by the urorectal septum. This red one here is the urorectal septum. The endodermal tube, which is one, is split into two by the urorectal septum. Into the urogenital system and the GIT, gastrointestinal rectum. This divides into the anterior part becomes the urogenital part and the posterior part becomes the gastrointestinal system. When all this is opening, when the, you, the uh, entourinary system and the gastrointestinal system is opening into one opening, that part is called the cloaca. Now, this is the urorectal septum, which is divided the hindgut into the anterior genitourinary part and the posterior rectum. Now, when it is the genitourinary part is together as one tube, it is called the urogenital sinus. We can see in the initial precursor of the urogenital sinus, the Wolfian duct, which becomes the epididymis in the future, drains into the urogenital sinus. And the paramesonephric ducts or the Mullerian ducts, which forms the urethra, uterus and the fallopian tube, also drain to the urogenital system. So what happens when the transformation occurs from the urogenital sinus to urinary and genital system as separate? So this is a picture of a cloaca, which is a developmental abnormality, whether the urinary, genital and the rectal opens into one single opening. See that there is no anus for this patient. So that is the no, the neurorectal septum is not properly developing. This is an example of urogenital sinus. The development is arrested at the point of urogenital sinus. The development is not happening beyond that. So what is happening is here is that you can see there is anus. The urorectal septum has divided the genitourinary system and the uh, GIT system as separate. But the genitourinary system, the vagina and bladder is vagina and urinary bladder is opening into the same opening. There is only single opening here. There is no two. There are no two openings for urethra and vagina. There is a single opening. So when we put a dike here, here, the vagina and the urethra will be seen. So that is the urogenital sinus. 
Now coming to the stage of undifferentiated genitalia, you know that the genital system and the urinary system develops in parallel. You cannot separate between the two. So how does the undifferentiated genitalia become the female and male genitalia too? You can see this was the undifferentiated genitalia with genital tubercle, genital fold and genital swellings. These genital swellings in future become the labia majora and the genital fold becomes the labia minora and the genital tubercle becomes the clitoris. And in male, you can see the genital folds becomes the shaft of the penis. The genital swellings becomes the scrotum and toward the testis descends and the genital tubercle becomes the glans penis. So this is the development of the male and female genitalia from the common precursor. And this here we can see the cannulation, the urethra is slowly developing in the genital fold. Now we can see the connection between the genital and urinary system in both males and females. First in the males. We can see from the testis, the epididymis goes there, goes, 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 goes back to the bladder near the posterior gland and it reaches here. Here we can see the ureter, it crosses the ureter and opens into the urethra. And seminal vesicles also opens through the opens into the urethra through a single opening in the urethra. Is there an opening like that? Yes, there is an opening like that. We can see that opening in the case of cystoscopy. When we put an endoscope through the urethra and we see a urethroscopy or a cystoscopy where we see a urinary bladder, we can see the opening like that as verumundanum. That opening where the genital system opens into the male urethra is called a verumundanum. Now what about the female? Females, we have already seen that the urogenital sinus into the urogenital sinus opens the paramesonephric duct which becomes the uterus, the fallopian tubes and lay, later the ovary comes near the fallopian tubes. In adult, what happens is that this point, this joining point, when the, in the completion of development reaches outside, so the urethra and vagina will have separate opening in the introitus. So, this is a separate opening. We have the clitoris here. Then we have the urethral orifice anteriorly and the vaginal orifice posteriorly. So, when we put a Foley's catheterization, always remember this anatomy. Don't put into the larger, easier hole. Always put into the smaller holes. Coming to the anatomy of the male urethra. The, what are the parts of male urethra? Male urethra is long. You can see a lot of bends here. So, this part of urethra which is in the penis is called penile urethra and this part of the urethra, we are here, here we have the bulbocavernosis and the bulbospongiosis muscles. Here we have the bulbar urethra. Then we have the pelvic membrane. The abdominal muscles come, continue into the pelvis as the abdominal muscles as the pelvic membrane which includes the urinary sphincter also is developed from these muscles. So this part of the urethra is called the membranous urethra and that part of urethra which passes through the prostate is called the prostatic urethra. So these are the four parts of the male urethra. Now coming to investigations. So the anatomy and the embryology is complete. Now we are coming to the investigations of the urethra. The investigations of the urethra include we have to see the internal anatomy of the urethra. The internal anatomy of the urethra is seen by the cystoscopy where we have, we are passing the scope through the, we are passing the scope through the urethra and reaches the bladder. So we are doing a cystoscopy and urethroscopy to see the internal anatomy of the urethra. Now another part, so we have seen the internal anatomy, but we have to see as a whole, what is the external anatomy of the bladder and the urethra for that? we can use a retrograde urethrogram. In retrograde urethrogram, we are putting a Foley's catheter, a small Foley's catheter in the glands. We are enlarging the bulb and we are putting a dye. When we put a dye, we can clearly see the penile urethra, the curving of the bulbar urethra, the membranous urethra where there is fossa navicularis and the prostatic urethra which is slit-like and the filling of the bladder making sure that there is no urethral obstruction. So this is the retrograde urethrogram, which is another investigation to understand the structure of the urethra. 
Now, next one is micturating cystoeurothelogram. What is happening in micturating cystoeurothelogram? We are putting a catheter. We are putting a dye inside the bladder. So, when we have filled the bladder like this, we get the filling phase of the micturating cystoeurothelogram. A urographin, a water soluble dye is put. And after that, the patient is asked to void. Okay. When the patient is asked to void, the patient urinates and we can see the urethra clearly like this. In function. Okay. In its natural function. In the retrograde urethrogram, we are putting the dye like that and see whether the urethra is enlarged or not. Whereas in micturating system urethrogram, you are seeing the urethra in action. You are taking the photo of the urethra in action. So that is shown in the voiding phase of the micturating system urethrogram. The micturating system urethrogram also gives, helps us to understand whether there is a vesico ureteric reflex, whether there is any reflex of the dye from the bladder to the ureter. So there is a filling phase and a voiding phase for the micturating cystoeurothelogram the overall relationship of the urethra in association with the pelvis can be understood from the contrast enhanced ct abdomen and pelvis where we take a delayed images after the urine has reached the after the dye has reached the kidney and the kidney bladder and the urethra so c ct and abdomen and pelvis help us to give the external relations so internal anatomy by cystoscopy around the per se the external anatomy by the retrograde urethrogram and micturating cystoeurothelogram and the surrounding anatomy with the help of CECT abdomen and pelvis now urethra is not just that there is a functional component to urethra also we had whatever the even the anatomy of the urethra is perfect the urine has to flow the urine has to stop and the urine should not dribble right so, the, whether the function of the urethra is proper, we use a uroflometry. Uroflometry is very simple. The patient is asked to urinate into this tub. So, as the urine comes into this tub, the amount of urine increases, 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 and there is a maximum flow rate. When there is maximum flow, the rate of increase is maximum. After that, the urine comes down. It is similar to the uh, uh, picture of the patient urinating or when we urinate, how the urine flows. Initially, there will be slow flow, then the flow increases, 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 then will be a decreased flow. So, this area under this curve will give us the total amount of urine voided. And it will give us some other things which we will see in the pathologies. Coming to the pathology of the male urethra. Male urethral problems can be seen in the pediatric age group or it can be seen in the adult age group. So, the newborn has born, the child has grown and the child is becoming adult. So, problems in the pediatric age group are mainly the posterior urethral valve and the hypospadias. Whereas, the problems of male urethra in adult are the urethral rupture and the urethral structure. Urethral rupture is more close to our heart. Because there is a high chance that we make a urethral rupture during our house urgency. So, if we are not careful, there will be a, during Foley's catheterization, there is a high chance that you will produce a urethral rupture. How can we be careful? When we put a Foley's catheter, always insert until the Y junction. Make sure that the urine is coming out through the Foley's catheter before inflating the bulb. So, that is how we avoid a urethral rupture. But this is not the most common cause for urethral rupture. The most common cause is trauma. We have to divide the urethral rupture into the anterior urethra and posterior urethra. The anterior urethra include the penile urethra and the bulbar urethra. Whereas the posterior urethra include the membranous urethra and the prostatic urethra and the membranous urethra. This is a picture of the here when the injury is here and the penile urethra. You can see a penile shaft hematoma and the penile shaft hematoma is prevented from extending anywhere by the bux fascia of the penis. So, there can be the shape of the penis can be changed due to the hematoma.
Next is the injury to the bulbar urethra. Here is the bulbar. So this is a penal urethra. And then here is the bulbar urethra. So this happens in the fall stride injury. And we can see a hematoma in the scrotum and the perineal region. So this is classical of the bulbar urethra injury. So this is called the fall stride injury or the straddle injury. You can generally, so this straddle injury is more common in males and not in females. So that is one of the reasons why you will not see a male gymnast showing a uh, pose like this. Because straddle injury and urethral injury, vulvar urethral injury will be very much common in males if they, if they do a pose like this. Extravasation of urine in bulbar. How will we know that the bulbar urethral injury is like that? We can see a hematoma of this butterfly shaped pattern. So, extravasation of urine in bulbar urethral injury is limited by a fascia called Coley's fascia. So, Buck's fascia we understood. It is a fascia of the penis. What is Coley's fascia? This Coley's fascia is actually a continuation of the Scarpa's fascia into the pelvic region. So we can see, we know the camber's fascia, the superficial fatty layer of camber and the deep layer of scar, membranous layer of scarpa in case in our abdomen. So this fascia is also extending into the pelvis. In the pelvis it is called Coley's fascia and it is joined in the near the perineal, joined to the perineal body. So there is a block near at that, that point. So the hematoma of the urethral injury in the bulbar urethra does not go beyond the Coley's fascia. So that is the importance of Coley's fascia and the butterfly hematoma in case of the bulbar urethral injury. Now coming to the membranous urethral injury. Membranous urethra where the pelvic diaphragm is there or the pelvic membrane is there. We call it as the membranous urethra. Again you can have a hematoma in the perineal region. So how will we differentiate between the bulbar urethral injury and the membranous urethral injury? You have to do a pro, uh, perrectal examination. In perrectal examination, you will not be able to palpate the prostate. The prostate, because there is hematoma and collection under the pelvic diaphragm, the prostate will go up. So, in perrectal examination, where we can normally palpate a prostate, it cannot be palpated in membranous urethral injury due to the high riding prostate. This is the prostatic urethra somewhere here. So what will happen if there is prostatic urethral injury? In the retropubic space, there will be collection of the urethra. Prostatic urethral injury is generally associated with pelvic fractures. We can see a fracture pelvis. And there will be extravasation of urine in the retropubic space. It can also be associated with bladder injury where the urine will go into the peritoneal cavity. So bladder injury can be extraperitoneal injury or can be intraperitoneal injury. If the urine breaks into the peritoneal cavity, there will be urinary peritonitis. Or if the urine is in the, retro, uh, in the retropubic space underneath the peritoneum, it will, be, it will mimic the prostatic urethral injury. So, whatever may be the problem, what is the initial management of this urethral injury? The patient will not be able to urinate if the urethra is injured. So, can we catheterize? We cannot catheterize per urethra because, because the urethra is not a tube anymore. It is broken down. It is broken. So, you cannot pass the tube into the bladder. But the urine has to come out. Otherwise, we have seen our broken sink. It is not just the problem of water getting in the sink. There will be obstructive uropathy due to the renal damage and can further lead on to uremia. So, first we have to empty the bladder. Is it easy? Not necessarily because there can be surrounding hematoma and the urine may be bloody in color also due to bladder condition. So, if we are not careful, we may not be maybe only draining the hematoma and not the bladder. So, under an ultrasound guidance, we can go for a catheterization. It, we, can, we may even use a Seldinger technique where we put a needle, aspirate urine, put guide wire and then followed by catheter. But suprapubic drainage is important in case of a urinary urethral injury in an acute phase. 
So once the patient is stable, generally these patients have pelvic fractures, they will not be stable. So there will be more problems like hypotension we have to manage. Will be polytrauma, there can be abdominal injury. So assess the injury once the patient is stable. So what are the types of injury? It can be a com uh, so it can be a complete rupture like this. It can be a partial rupture, or it can be even just a contusion of the wall without any disruption of the urethra. So how will we assess once the patient is stable? We use a retrograde urethrogram and see the urethra. So how will the urethra appear in retrograde urethra? We can see in a contusion, the retro, in retrograde urethrogram, we can see the complete urethra. The ure, this is the prostatic urethra which is slit like and the urethra that the bladder is filling. So, in contusion, you may not see any external injuries. And the management of this kind of injuries is generally conservative. Coming to the partial rupture of the bladder, partial rupture of urethra. In partial rupture of the urethra, only it is partially ruptured, so bladder fills. But there is partial rupture of the urethra, so there will be extra cessation of urine. So, we have to do an suprabubic catheterization and ultrasound guidance, and we have to repair it once the patient is completely stable. A delayed repair is generally done in case of a partial rupture of the bladder. Now, coming to the complete rupture of the urethra. Here we can see the urethra is not continuous anymore. Okay, so the, the, the urethra is not anymore continuous, it is broken. So the it will not fill the bladder. There will be no bladder filling, but there will be extra cessation of urine. Again, suprabubic catheterization and delayed repair is the treatment. What is the delayed repair? What will we do in delayed repair? This is an repair of the penile urethra where the anterior urethroplasty is done. So anterior of the penile urethral injury, we do a urethroplasty. We repair the urethra with the surrounding tissue. The entire penis is, can be degloved and the surrounding tissue of the fascia of the uh, deep fascia of the penis can be harvested and we can repair the defect of the in the urethra with that fascia. So that is that includes the urethroplasty. But what is the posterior urethra is injured? You can see we can see the posterior urethra is down here, okay, underneath the near the scrotum. So we will have to put an incision like this and perineal incision like this, and through that we have to approach the urethra and repair. Now, is urethral repair so simple? No, there will be complications of urethral injury due to urethral disruption. There will be hematoma formation. There will be fibrosis, scarring. So what will we do then? We have a scar, we have a hematoma and we have scarring. We have to excise the scar first and then only repair the urethra. So this is an excision of the scar and then anastomosis is a challenging process. Now another complication of urethra. It is incontinence. This especially happens when the membrane is urethra is injured. When the membrane is urethra is injured, this is a muscle which is the pelvic membrane. The membrane is urethra is injured. The external urethral sphincter happens in the membrane is urethra. So the external urethral sphincter is injured. So it can result in incontinence. Another injury which will cause incontinence is the bladder neck injury. In male urethra, two components causes two components results in Continents. One is the external urethral sphincter and next is the bladder neck. Two components as are there for continence mechanism. The urine should not dribble. So there are two continence mechanisms. In female urethra, there is only one, the external urethral sphincter. So in male, even if the membrane is urethra is ruptured or the bladder neck up is ruptured, it can be associated with incontinence. Now the incontinence of the urethra can be due to muscle injury it can also be due to due, be also be due to nerve injury so the nerve supply to the urinary sphincters can result in incontinence the s2 to s4 spinal segment supply via pudendal nerve to the external urethral sphincter if that nerve supply or its nerve roots are affected there will be incontinence and bladder neck is supplied by t10 to t12 so that will also result in incontinence 
but nerve supply if the nerve supply to the urethra is affected it is more than incontinence how we can see that the genitourinary system is together right so what will happen once the genitourinary system is together the problem is nerves when nerve supply is affected the nerve supply to the arteries of the corpora cavernosa is also affected so the parasympathetic system the s2 to s4 is associated with erection if the nerve supply to the parasympathetic supply is affected it will result in a flaccid penis okay so parasympathetic system results in erection if that nerve supply is affected there will be impotence another is sympathetic system which include t10 to t12 so it makes the sympathetic the fright flight fight reaction makes our penis flaccid so if that system is affected the penis will always be erect so that is also a problem with the damage to the nerve supply of the urethra so we have discussed about the complication of urethra injury includes urethral disruption and there are associated fibrosis and hematoma formation urinary incontinence with muscle and urinary nerve supply erectile dysfunction parasympathetic and sympathetic erectile dysfunctions another one is the problems due to the extravasation of urines we have already discussed that the urine can extravasate into the peritoneal cavity and the urine can extravasate into the retropubic space extra peritoneally which can further lead on to infection so in the, if there is a feature of extravasation of urine we should also make sure that that extravasated urine is also drained next complication of urethral injury is urethral structure but urethral injury is not the only cause for urethral structure a lot of other causes can result in urethral structure so what are the causes of urethral structure one is inflammatory cause urethral structure can result secondary to urethritis or secondary to balanitis cirrhotica obliterans the injury the inflammation due to urethritis results also in the bulbar urethra due to the bulbar urethral glands if they are injured there can again be urethritis uh, uh, there can be structure in the bulbar urethra next one is traumatic cause that we have already discussed bulbar urethral injury and pelvic fracture and urethral disruption injury all that can cause urethral structure next is iatrogenic causes iatrogenic causes include secondary to urethral instrumentation including catheterization and transurethral prostatectomy so during catheterization if we inflate the bulb inside the urethra there can be urethral injury resulting in stricture then prostatic transurethral resection of prostate in benign prostatic hypertrophy when we resect it there can be a urethral structure later on now secondary to radical prostatectomy and secondary to radiotherapy for prostate can prostatic cancer all these are iatrogenic causes of structure and there is another one which is idiopathic causes of urethral structure now what are the investigations of urethral structure these are the investigations which we have already discussed in the assessment of the urethra so investigations of the urethra in cystoscopy we can see the structure here the hole is narrowed down we see remember initially the cystoscopy video the hole was big then we have the retrograde urethrogram we can see the structure in the bulbar urethra here we can see a structure in the bulbar urethra retrograde urethrogram the bladder is not filling properly now comes the flowmetry we have just heard the flowmetry and left it like that right so in euro flowmetry what happens is that we have a curve like that the increase in the flow of urine and decrease in the flow of urine but in case of the urethral structure the verb is slight increase in flow then the flow will be constant for a long time and only then it will decrease so in the graph it will be seen so like that the euro flowmetry graph there will be slight increase in flow and it will be a plateau shaped euro flowmetry so that is the feature of the urethral structure in case of uroflowmetry now the treatment includes the urethral dilators so and this is the urethral dilators we can see we put it inside the urethra this curve here is for the curvature of the bulbar urethra then we have endoscopic urethrotomy what is endoscopic urethrotomy 
we can cut the walls of the structure like that and enlarge the urethra. So that is the, this is a structure before dividing and the structure after dividing, this, this hole is enlarged. But generally in traumatic urethral structures, it is not done. It is done in other causes of urethral structures because in traumatic urethral structures, we may not know how much disruption is there. And finally, we will go for the urethroplasty, which we have already discussed. We dissect out, the, dissect out the urethra, understand the point of structure, cut that structure, mobilize the remaining urethra and anastomose it together. So that is regarding the treatment of urethral structure. Now we are coming to the pediatric age group. What are the main problems in the pediatric age group? One is the posterior urethral valve and the another one is the hypospadias. First come to the posterior urethral valve. There is a valve like this, which is a, a small opening in the posterior urethra. That is posterior urethral valve. Why there is a posterior urethral valve? That is a developmental problem. You see the Wolfian duct is opening into the urogenital sinus or the urinary system. So once the Wolfian duct, if the opening of the Wolfian duct is abnormal, there can be a valve-like deformity there. It is called a posterior urethral valve. It acts like a structure. But what is the difference between posterior urethral valve and the adult urethral structure? Because posterior urethral valve happens in the development, during the time of development in the embryo. So this will result in the abnormal ureters and abnormal kidneys. So when we see a posterior urethral valve, we have to make sure that the ureters and kidneys are normal or we have to assess the problems with it. But how will the posterior urethral valve present? In the initial patient, we have seen a good stream of urine in a newborn, in a baby. This good stream of urine means there is no posterior urethral valve. In posterior, in posterior urethral valve, the stream of the urine will be poor. The other patient can present with the recurrent UTI. Generally, posterior urethral valve always in males. Wolfian ducts always in males. There is no posterior urethral valve in females. The, the, the male patient presenting with poor stream of urine or recurrent UTI, think of posterior urethral valve. In pediatric age group, there will not be any recurrent UTI. If there is a recurrent UTI, always think about an anatomical abnormality in the genitourinary tract. So, poor stream of urine and recurrent UTI are the, will ring a bell to, in the pediatric age group, towards the posterior urethral valve. The diagnosis, one of the first line of diagnosis is by micturating sister urethrogram. In micturating sister urethrogram, you can see the posterior urethral valve is in the posterior urethra. The posterior urethra is dilated, the anterior urethra is narrow. So, here is the valve. So, micturating sister urethrogram demonstrate the posterior urethral valve. Now, what about the ureters? Again, ureters can be seen in micturating cystic urethrogram. If there is a reflex in MCU, then you can see a right mega ureter, a right-sided big ureter due to reflex. This is a newborn patient, mind you. This is not an adult patient or a young age. This is a picture of the newborn patient showing the ureter like this. So, this ureter can be due to reflex. And so, then we think that the opposite ureter is normal. No, the opposite ureter opposite ureter is not normal. In the opposite ureter, it is also dilated. Here, it is due to obstructive mega ureter. So, the right ureter which is dilated is due to the reflex and the left ureter is dilated due to obstruction at the ureter and the bladder. So, this posterior urethral valve can affect the bladder development, causing problems in the junction between the ureter and the bladder. The junction between the ureter and bladder. In the right side, we can see an obstruction in, in the reflex, and the left side, it has an obstruction in this particular case. There are other cases where there will be both obstructed mega ureter. This particular child has a posterior urethral valve. We can see a dilated posterior urethra, but apparently, there is no problems for ureters in the micturating sister urethra. But when an MRI is taken, an MR urogram is taken. We can see the both ureters are dilated like that. So in this case, it is both obstructed mega ureters. It can be either both mega reflexing or obstructed or a reflex and an obstructed. The left side reflexing, right side obstructed. Any combination can happen. So with this kind of ureter, 
and with, with this kind of ureters and with this kind of urethra during the time of development will the kidneys be normal we don't know so we need to assess the renal function we do a dmsa renogram dmsa renogram what happens the dmsa dye is given intravenously and there will be uptake by the kidney and it will be if the kidney is functioning it will uptake the dye and it will stay there so in this kidney you can see the right kidney this is a posterior view and this is the left kidney and this is the right kidney the left kidney the uptake is better the right kidney there is not that much uptake there will be areas of not that much uptake so that is the feature of scarring in the kidney due to the non development this fibrosis of the kidney the scarring of the kidney we can see the so this why is there is different pictures like that because we can see a posterior view anterior view right, right posterior oblique right, right anterior oblique left anterior oblique anterior posterior there are different views of this kidney because kidney is like a model okay you take the camera the uh, nuclear camera you give the nuclear dye dmsa and you take the nuclear camera in you know, of the kidney in different positions so in one in a posterior view take the kidney from the posterior in anterior view kidney take from the anterior right to posterior oblique the camera is here left to posterior oblique the rest to posterior oblique the camera is here so we get a photo of kidney in different postures in dmsa renogram so that we can imagine we can get a three dimensional image of the kidney in our mind and see the scarring in the different parts of the kidney so we can can get an, a mathematical uh, assessment also by left kidney 74 percentage and right kidney 76 percentage so that is called split renal function if there is a total renal function how does each kidney functions that is called split split renal function so ideally the split renal function should be 50 50 percent 50 percent for the right kidney 50 percent of left kidney so here the left kidney is 74 percent and the right kidney is 26 percent that does not mean that the left kidney is functioning more it only means that for the total kidney function left kidney takes the right 74 percentage and right kidney takes the 26 percentage okay it does not mean that both kidneys are functioning well even if a 74 kidney percentage fit functioning kidney may not be functioning as a normal kidney because in the total renal function left kidney takes the 74 percentage so total renal function we have to determine from the renal function test now what is the treatment of this posterior urethral valve so we have to assess the posterior urethral valve under these following headings the treatment of posterior urethral valve is by cystoscopy and fulguration so this is the posterior urethral valve and once we fulgurate we can see that the valve is disrupted and the opening is enlarged yes the problem in the urethra is over the problem in the ureter and kidney is not over the patient can go in for a chronic renal failure and the renal failure has to be managed so posterior urethral valve is not just an anatomical obstruction it has a lot of functional problems in the kidneys and the ureters now next comes the problem is hypospadias hypospadias we have seen about the gonadal development in males we can see the initial opening is here and this one is cannulated later so this opening if it doesn't reach the tip it is somewhere 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 here 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 all this cut goes hypospadias so what are the different types of hypospadias it can be called as anterior middle or posterior hypospadias or mild moderate or severe hypospadias or type 1 type 2 or type 3 hypospadias depending upon the position of the urethra so we will basically call it glandular glandular or a subcoronal penile is penile hypospadias uh, penoscrotal hypospadias if it is here and a perineal hypospadias if it is here so there are different classifications for hypospadias basically depending upon the position of the urethral opening now hypospadias is again also is not a simple problem okay hypospadias the if the opening is at the genitourinary system is developing together okay so if the opening is at the tip the urethra will grow completely like that if the opening has not reached until that there will be fibrosis of the not opening part there where there is no opening and the penis will bend like this this bending of the penis is called cording okay so 
we have to even if we don't if we have to correct the cordy first the bend first it can be any type of bends the bend first and then only bring the opening to the tip so cordy correction is the first step in the hypospadias correction after the correction of cordy we will have to go for a urethroplasty so what is urethroplasty doing we have, can see that the opening is here there is no opening until here so suppose this is the tissue there suppose the tissue there is like that we will make the make a tube with the tissue the tissue is like in the existing like that we will make a tube with the tissue so flaps are raised here and we are making a tube with that tissue and closing the skin over it so this is a one of the methods there are many methods for corruption correction of uh, many methods of urethroplasty for the correction of hypospadias but this is one of the method for hypospadias correction now another thing is epispadias now in the first one the opening did not reach here in here the and it is going down stairs so in another thing there will be epispadias what exactly happening in epispadias is epispadias is a kind of lower abdominal maldevelopment so the lower part of abdominal wall is not is not developed completely so what happens we can see the different type of epispadias we can see the glandular epispadias we can see the penile epispadias and we can see the penopubic epispadias you see the penopubic epispadias by the penopubic epispadias you can understand that the lower part of abdominal wall is not completely closed. That is the main problem with the epispadias rather than the development of the urethra. The lower part of the abdomen is not completely closed. So that is, these are the different type of epispadias. Now coming to the miscellaneous parts. There are some miscellaneous parts. I'll just run through it. Urethral stone. We can see the uh, because the external urethral sphincter or the meatus is one of the narrowest portion. There can be urethral stone at the meatus. Urethral diverticulum. Due to the devil, a developmental abnormality, we can see a diverticulum inside diverticulum in the urethra, and this is the septum in between that. Urethroscopy and division of the diverticulum is the treatment. Then urethral fistula. We can see we can see the, the opening in the urethra like that where uh, the urine can dribble this generally happens when there is an anterior structure it is very common after the treatment for hypospadias when there is a structure in the anteriorly repaired segment the urine can dribble from the urethral fistula coming to the urethral neoplasms are comparatively rare but we can be identified in cystoscopy and managed now we will come take our discussion to the female urethra Female urethra anatomy is always important. Anteriorly urethra, posteriorly vagina, always catheterized in the anterior hole. Okay, so that is regarding the female urethra. One of the problems of urethra is urethral prolapse. This we are going to see in gyne. This is the picture of urethral prolapse. This is the picture of urethral prolapse. This is we are we are going to see the see in gyne along with the uterine prolapse. The urethra prolapse through the anterior vaginal wall so this is another picture of urethra and the bladder prolapsing so this is the anterior vaginal the, the urinary system is anterior the genital system is posterior so this is the anti, uh, anterior vaginal wall and the urethra is being prolapsed into the anterior vaginal wall due to the weakening of the anterior vaginal wall the bladder can also prolapse into the anterior vaginal wall then it is called a cystocele so cystocele and urethrocele can occur together we have to we should see that in your gynec postings in the in case of uh, uterine prolapse see whether there is a cystocele or a urethrocele and if the rectum is prolapsing through the posterior vaginal wall it is called a rectocele okay now urethral structures in the females generally the three centimeter four centimeter urethra in females there can be structure along with birth trauma but urethral structures in females as it is short is generally treated by urethral dilatation now fowler syndrome again the urine is coming in both in urethral structure and here the end in, in, in uh, fowler syndrome the urine is not coming properly one is treatable by dilatation fowler syndrome is not treatable dil by dilatation why because it is a functional problem due to the poorly relaxing urethral sphincter the pelvic musculature forms the urethral sphincter due to the poorly relaxing urethral sphincter the urine is flowing there is no anatomical obstruction how will we diagnose it by electromyography we will come to it 
intermittent catheterization in this treatment there is no use in dilatation what is electromyography so this is the vagina and the bladder we have we are assessing the pelvic musculature okay so we put uh, a needle with a wire into the pelvic muscles and sedate the patient we put a needle to the pelvic muscle and then we go in for when then we go for an electrical tracing of that pelvic musculature when we see the electrical tracing like the cardiac tracing like the ecg the muscle action of the pelvic muscles can also be recorded so this is a normal tracing where we can see some amount of uh, then uh, some amount of uh, contraction in the pelvic musculature but in case of fowler syndrome there are different activities seen in fowler syndrome there will be increased contraction of the pelvic musculature so the sphincter will be tight and the urine will not flow even if we dilate there is no use the muscle will again contract so there is no use in dilatation we have to give uh, do intermittent catheterization and another one is urethral carangal this is a problem with connective tissue disorder initially we look like it looks like urethral prolapse but generally this is tender more vascular and it is a connective tissue stroma urethral prolapse is not at all vascular not at all tender this requires excision and this is a connective tissue stroma it is called the urethral carangal next is genital urinary valve warts which is called papilloma acuminata it is associated with human papilloma virus surgery or laser is the treatment so genital warts can be seen like that carcinoma urethra can also present like that if it is grows out so tumors neoplasms we have to think both about warts and carcinoma urethra next is urinary incontinence this is the female urethra is short and uh, there is a chance for birth trauma and there is a uh, short urethra and only the external sphincter there is no bladder neck control mechanisms the female urethra there is more chance for urinary incontinence reincontinence so in brief we have discussed about the embryology of the urethra the common precursor to separate urethra and external genitalia systems then the anatomy of male and female urethra both the internal and external anatomy we have discussed then we have done in the investigations of the urethra inside the urethra outside the urethra around the urethra then we have discussed the pathology of male pathology the male urethra urethral injury and urethral structure uh, in the children we have discussed about the posterior urethral valve and hypospadias then we have discussed the pathology of the female urethra the functional problems and the anatomical problems so that is regarding urethra thank you